Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message, but at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. Well, uh, hey, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob and I am the lead pastor here at the bridge. And we just want to welcome you and say that we're glad to have you here this morning. Am I on? I think I am. Okay. All right. And uh, uh, man, we're jumping into a new series today. So I hope you're excited about that. Um, before we do that, though, I want to encourage you guys hey, uh, I've been handing these out. I handed these out during first service. These are little uh, window decals. For your cars, if you consider yourself a regular attender at the bridge, will you do us a favor? Go grab one of those window decals and put them on your car, okay? But here's the deal. If you're going to be cutting people off and flipping them the bird, don't get one of these, okay? I don't need that kind of representation, okay? Yeah, if you're going to be putting this on your car, you're repping Jesus, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but we want to encourage you to grab one of these. Let's do everything we can to just get the word out about uh, uh, what God's doing in our church, amen? Because he's doing good things, right? Everybody say good things. Good things. That's, oh man, that's the best response I got all morning. That's good. So, hey, uh, I'm excited to get into the Word this morning. I hope you are too. Why don't we, uh, why don't we pray and uh, just make sure that Jesus is a part of it, and then we'll get moving. Sound good? All right, Father, um, man, how blessed are we to be a part of your family? How, how blessed are we to be a part of this family, Lord? Um, God, I thank you for all the faces in the room this morning. I thank you for all the new faces that are in the room this morning. I thank you for all the um, older faces that are in the room this morning, God. Um, I thank you for family and the love and the, the joy that I have every Sunday to be able to hang out with these people, Lord. And I just pray um, for your blessing as we try to study your word, break it down, and, and listen to what your Spirit's got for us today, Lord. So help us to get out of the way, and, and, and God, just, just work on our hearts, Lord. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. One day, Jesus was teaching by the lake, and uh, as usual, when Jesus began teaching and preaching, uh, crowds began to gather, because Jesus spoke as one who had what? Authority, authority right? One who had authority. And so, so crowds began to gather, and people were listening to Jesus, and they were really excited, and, and, and at one point, it got so crowded that Jesus decided, you know what, I'm going to hop into a boat, and I'm going to preach from a boat. Now, why did he do this? Some of you may not know this, but scientifically, sound actually travels better over water. Did you know that? Uh, it actually travels better over water, uh, water. And so Jesus got in the boat, pushed the boat a little way, bit away from shore, and continued to preach and teach the people. And at one point, he jumps into a story that just kind of comes out of nowhere about a farmer. Listen to what he says. He says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and some and the birds came and ate it up. And then, then some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up, but the soil was what? Say it together. Shallow. It was shallow. But when the sun came up, the roots were scorched and withered because they had no root. The plants, excuse me. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So they did not bear any grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. Everybody say good soil. good soil. And it came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Now that's kind of a random story that Jesus kind of pulled out, right? And so he kind of just left it at that. You know, he said these words. He said, whoever has ears, let them hear. In other words, in other words, if you got ears, raise your hand, Okay. Okay, okay yeah, everybody should be raising their hand unless you got into a tragic accident or you were born some weird way, okay? <laughs> and if you were, I apologize. Okay. I'm so offensive. Okay. Uh, Jesus says, if you have ears, you need to listen because this is a big deal. Like, this really matters. And then he leaves it. And the apostles are kind of confused, right? They're a little they're like, all right, Jesus, like, what do you get in that? Right? Like, I don't, I don't understand, right? So eventually, a little time, sometime later, the, the apostles walk up to Jesus and they go, hey, Jesus, uh, that story you told about the farmer and the seeds, like, hey, man, great story, okay? <laughs> like, that was a great story. Um, uh, what did it mean? 
right? Like, like what, what were you getting at there? And, and, and there's, a, there's a little side truth here that you need to hear, okay? In that sometimes, sometimes we don't get what we need or what we want from God because we don't ask for it. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, well, Rob, I'm struggling with this. Well, Rob, I'm looking for clarity on this. Well, Rob, this isn't working out. Well, Rob, I just don't understand. And I go, well, have you prayed about it? And they're like, oh, maybe, I, no, I'm not sure I have. It's a little side nugget, okay? Because the disciples, they asked Jesus. And what's he do? He tells them the meaning of the story. Listen to what he says. He says this. He says, the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. What's the word? It's God's truth, amen? amen. Right? Where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and snatches it away. The word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown in rocky places, they hear the word and at once they receive it with joy and they're so excited about this whole Jesus thing that they just discovered. But since it's got no root and it really hasn't had much time to grow and they really haven't put themselves in the right place and their hearts aren't really in the right place, they, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, they, they hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke out the word, making it, everybody say this together, unfruitful. In farmer's terms, that would mean useless. Verse 20, others, like seed sown on the good soil, everybody say good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Let me just jump into this series right away and just, just be really blunt with you as I ask a question. How deeply rooted is your faith? I've said this before, I think too many of us think our faith is deep when our lives don't show much evidence of that. When our lives aren't producing fruit, if any at all. What does Jesus say here? He says, others like seed sown on good soil. Okay, A lot of us like to think we're good soil. And yet, that means that we hear the word, we accept it, and this is the caveat, right? Because, because the, the seed among rocky places and the seed among, soil, among the, the thorny soil, right? They all received and accepted it, right? But what's the difference between the good soil and, and the other soil? It says this, they produce a crop. They are fruitful. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. This year, I've spent some time, uh, spent more time fishing on the Cedar River than I ever have in my entire life, okay? And much of that was because my boat trailer uh, got broke, okay? And uh, yes, I'm the one that broke it. Uh, I neglected to uh, grease a bearing that ended up turning into a fireball as I was driving it down the road, okay? And I remember Sean and I, we backed my trailer into my, my, my driveway, and I got out, and we're unloading our gear, and I'm like, you smell something, Sean? And Sean goes, yep. And we looked down, and my bearing's just smoking, okay? And so I, I, I didn't have my boat for like two or three months this summer. Some of you guys probably noticed it sitting in the back corner of the church parking lot, um, but uh, anyway, uh, so I, got, I, I ended up spending a lot of time fishing on the Cedar River, mostly on the bank. Uh, but then I got to meet an awesome guy by the name of Ben Baker, okay? Uh, and Ben is going on the fishing trip with us because he's fantastic, okay? Uh, no, but Ben and I, we, we, we started, we said, when I met him and he started attending the bridge, I was like, hey man, you're a fisherman, I'm a fisherman. You got a boat, I don't got a boat, let's get on your boat, right? <laughs> and so we got in his boat, and once a week we'd go out on the Cedar River where we'd fish the Cedar River. Now, now here's the thing about the Cedar River, okay? The Cedar River, especially, specifically the stretch north of town, okay, it tends to have a lot of shallow spots, okay? It has a lot of shallow spots. And so Ben and I, usually when we get on the river, the first thing we do is we look for what? Depth. We look for two things. We look for depth and structure, and if you want to add a third, we look for rocks, Okay, so we're, 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 we're fishing every week, and that's what we would always do. But here was the thing. Sometimes, in order to get to the deep parts, we'd have to go over the shallow parts, right? And, and, and I remember uh, there were multiple times, there were multiple times where we're ripping through the shallows, and then um, even just a few weeks ago, we're ripping through the shallows, and at one point, it just goes, 
bang, the whole boat shakes. I like lean forward a little bit, right? I'm like, what was that? And Ben goes, uh, I think we hit a log. I was like, you think? <laughs> right? Like, like because, 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 because the shallows, hear me church, the shallows are dangerous. At least they can be. And not only that, not only that, the shallows are not where life is found. Where is life found? In the deep. That's usually where we found the fish. That's usually where we found the most activity. That's usually where we got the most bites. Was in the shallow, was in the deep, unless, unless we were up against the bank, but even then we didn't have as much luck as we did in the deep. And you know, faith, faith isn't all that different. It's not, church. God calls us to have a deep faith. I, I really believe that. We, we, we see that in our passage today. He calls us to have a faith that is deeply rooted in Christ. And in this passage, we find out that God doesn't honor a shallow faith. There's no fruit that comes from shallow faith, right? And not only that, shallow faith doesn't really get us very far. What does it say about the first three seeds? It says, it says the first three seeds only last a short time, Quickly fall away and don't bear fruit. These are the effects of shallow faith. If you haven't caught on yet, this week we're jumping into a series called Shallow, right? And the whole idea behind this series comes from a personal conviction that God has placed on my heart to build real disciples. I preached that a couple weeks ago. I said, God, like, what, what do you want for our church? And God just simply said, Rob, I want you guys to build real disciples, I just want you to do that. And here's, here's where I got the affirmation, okay? We were talking about it as a staff this week. And the, the, during staff meeting on Tuesday, like the number one topic that we were talking about was how shallow so many Christians can be so often. And how we as a church, we as a church, we can't just sit here and complain about it. We have to do something about it, amen? Like we have to step into it. We have to do everything we can to help our people go deep and encourage others to go deep as well. And so we, we had a really long conversation about that. But here's the deal. It's not just our job to go deep. It's not just um, uh, uh, my job to go deep. It's all of our jobs to go deep, right? Amen? Right? Like, like to build real disciples, to build real disciples, we have to be fruitful. And that's not just Pastor Rob's job. That's not the, just the leader's job or the board's job or whoever it is. It is our job if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, it is your job to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My dream as your pastor is to not be baptizing people up here. You know why? Because I want you to be baptizing people up here. Amen? Because it's our job to make disciples of all nations. It's our job to take ownership of that. It's our job to go deep into our faith and encourage others to do the same. But here's the deal. If we're going to raise up real disciples, we better make sure we're real deep disciples ourselves, right? Right? We better make sure we're going deep as well. We better make sure that we're modeling what God's called us to, to be real disciples. So as we step into the series, as we step into the series, we want to study what it means to be a follower of Jesus that is full of real depth. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about four different topics as it pertains to, to, to depth, okay? The first week, we're going to talk about depth of faith. That's today, okay? The next week, we're going to talk about depth of knowledge. That's right. It's your job to know the word. Stop depending on Pastor Rob and all the leaders to know the word. That's your job to know the word, amen? Depth of relationships. God's called you to deep, real relationships as a follower of Jesus. And finally, to have depth of deed. And I mean that. To, to be deep in your works and the things that you do in the name of Jesus. We're going to study faith, knowledge, Relationships and deeds. Now, here's what's awesome. Okay, a few months ago, I laid as God kind of laid this series on my heart. Um, I, I said, "All right, Lord, like this is what we're, I, I feel like. This is where we're headed. I, I'm going to wait for you to kind of just affirm that for me." Um, and He did. Okay. Uh, the, the funny thing is, is, if you were with us last week, um, Pastor Tim. Uh, was able to preach, and he did an excellent job. Uh, but the funny thing was, uh, when I asked Tim, uh, when Tim asked me, uh, when I asked him to preach, excuse me, when I asked him to preach, he said, sure thing, what's my passage or my topic? 
right? Because usually we're in some kind of a series or something, and so Tim asks for like a passage or a topic, and I'm like, you know what, man? Like, we're going to be between sermon series, so you can just pick whatever topic you want, okay? And then uh, I asked him last week, I was like, hey, man, like, what are you preaching on Sunday? Like, I'm looking forward to listening to it online after I get back, and, and he goes, oh, I'm preaching on faith. And I thought that was hilarious because that was today's topic, <laughs> That was today's topic. So that was affirmation for me that this is where we're supposed to be going, okay? And so what I want to do is, um, because Tim did such an excellent job kind of uh, taking this topic, what I want to do is I want to, I want to um, kind of talk about what he talked about, and then we're going to go deeper. Get it? Okay, all right, yeah, you can hold on to that, put it in your pocket if you don't get that now, okay? You can go, oh yeah, deeper, I get it now, okay? All right, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna jump into, kind of review what Tim talked about last week, and then we're going to talk about ourselves, um, uh, what it means... Um, to have a shallow faith, what that looks like, the signs that we see of a shallow faith. Okay, so first off, last week, Tim talked about this. He said, faith is how we please God. How we what? Please God, okay? It's like a fragrant aroma to God, okay? You ever, has your child ever done something for you and you're just like, man, I, I could not be happier or more proud of them for what they just did, right? When, when you believe on God in faith, that's, that's that same feeling that he feels. You realize that? It, it's how we please God. That's what faith is, okay? It's not how God accepts us. It's how we please him, amen? Okay, but, but faith is not so many things. And I love that he broke down what faith is not because so, so many times we, we kind of confuse faith for what it really is and we mistake it for what it's been meant to be, okay? First of all, faith is not just some positive attitude, okay? How many of you would describe yourselves as an optimist? Raise your hand, okay? Yep, you're like my wife, uh, not like me, okay? I'm, I tend to be cynical, and I tend to be an optimist. Uh, Eric's the same way. You can pray for our church, okay? Uh, Eric's our assistant pastor. He's the same way. No. Um, it's, not, it's more than just, hey, we're just going to go get them, everybody, right? Like, if that's what faith is, that's shallow, and I'm out on that, right? Amen? Right? But then it's also not just an intellectual acceptance of beliefs. It's, it's not just this, okay, well, faith is this, 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 this. And as long as you have this, 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 then you're going you're gonna to get into heaven. That's what faith is. But then it's also not a blind leap of, uh, separated from intellect. I, I, I want to kind of resound what Tim said last week. I know so many smart people that are way smarter than I am that love Jesus probably deeper than I do in so many regards because they have taken the intellectual side of faith and they've picked it apart and they've questioned it and they've wrestled with God over it and went, nope, this is the right thing. This is what makes the most sense to me, okay? So if you're here today and, and maybe you're new to the faith or, or you're exploring this whole faith thing and you're like, man, I'll be honest with you, believing this whole Jesus thing kind of just makes me feel like I got to jump off the intellectual ledge. No, you don't. No, you don't. As a matter of fact, the whole reason that I came to believe in Jesus is because Jesus just made the most sense to me. And I see God's word prove itself over and over and over and over again throughout my life. And then lastly, lastly, and this is a big one, faith is not a way to manipulate God, okay? God's not just some genie in a bottle that's just going to give you whatever you want. You hear what I'm saying? All right, he's not there to, to, to be at our beck and call. We're going to dig into that a little bit more this morning, okay? But here's what faith is. Faith is being sure of what I hope for. It gives me a peace that transcends all understanding. It helps me push through and have a different kind of attitude when other people might be freaking out and living in chaos, right? It gives me an otherworldly perspective. It's, it's what gives substance behind my beliefs. It's one thing to believe in something. It's a whole other thing to, to back it up with passion, amen? Like what gives substance to my beliefs? And then it is also the conviction, the conviction that what I can't see is real. We talked about this in our Daniel series this summer. We talked about the fact that there's a spiritual realm and there are things going on beyond what we can see with the naked eye. Spiritual things that impact who we are, what we say, what we do, what we allow. And, and, and faith is the conviction that I can, that I can trust and what I cannot see. May, faith has a massive purpose in our lives and we cannot take it for granted. And, and, and and now that we know that what faith is, I, I want to ask you the question again, like I said earlier, how deep is your faith? Because I think it's easy for a lot of us to just assume that we're rich soil. I think more often than not, we tend to give ourselves more credit than we realize because we judge ourselves based on our intentions, right? 
That's the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes we make as human beings is that we judge ourselves based on our intentions, but we judge everyone else based on their actions, right? When James, actually we're going to talk about this in a few weeks, James says, your faith is dead without what? Deeds. It's deeds. If you're not doing anything with what I've given you, God's saying, it's a waste. It's an absolute waste. So, so, so how deep is your faith? Because... because it's easy for us to assume that we're rich soil when too often I fear that we're not. And, and Jesus, Jesus is really clear about what shallow faith looks like in this passage we just read, isn't he? He's very clear about it. So, so, so this is what I want to do. I, I want us to jump into Mark chapter 4 again, okay? I know we just read it on the screen, okay? But if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go ahead and grab those out now. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, you can go ahead and grab one of those black Bibles from the chair racks in front of you, okay? We're not going to put the main passage of scripture, scripture back on the screen because we want you getting into God's Word, okay? The book of Mark is about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way into your Bible, okay? It should be Matthew, Mark. You'd be in the New Testament, and it'll be Matthew and then Mark. If you've hit Luke or John, you've gone too far, okay? If you're joining us online, we want to encourage you to get in the Word as well. Maybe you don't have a Bible at home. A great way to get into Scripture is to just download version, Y-O-U version, uh, on your smart tablet or device, whatever you're watching from. Um, it's a great way to read Scripture and share it with others. Uh, guys, and, and if you're here with us in the congregation, I hope you have this app on your, on your, uh, on your phone, okay? This is an awesome app that helps you do devotions each day. I know so many friends... This is how they started getting into the Word, was just having this app on their phone, and they get a notification every day as a reminder to, to get into the Word and to read their Bible. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Um, but, but we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, okay? And uh, we're mainly going to be, um, we're going to just skip down to Jesus' explanation of the soil, okay? So we're going to pick things up in verse 13, and I want to read this again. And then what we're going to do after we get through this is we're going to talk about the three different signs that Jesus talks about of shallow faith in God, okay? So, so starting in verse 13, let's just read this together. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable if you don't get this one? In other words, this one's foundational, right? This is the most foundational thing you can know is what Jesus is saying. And then we get to verse 15, uh, Verse 14, the farmer sows the word, okay? Some people are like the seed along the path where the seed is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Kind of reminds me of like pigeons at the park, right? Or the geese, like you drop that bread, boom, it's gone. As soon as it hits the path, right? Verse 16, others like seed sown among rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy, but since they have no root... They last only a short time. This, this reminds me of people that put their faith in Christians rather than Jesus. This reminds me of people that, that hold fast to the church rather than the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you something? I, I love our church. I'm so thankful for our church. But if, you're, if your church is the foundation of your faith, you're going to be sorely um, upset and disappointed because the church is imperfect. And it will let you down. I, I ask this question all the time. How many of us have been hurt by the church? Raise your hand. Come on. Right? But our, our root is not there, is it? Because that's rocky soil. So let's keep going. But since they have no root, verse 17, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, when someone hurts us, when the church doesn't listen to us, when people wrong us, when things don't go our way, when people persecute us because of our faith, they quickly fall away. Verse 18, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Jesus talks about signs of a shallow faith. And he's pretty clear about it. Like, like so often we think that we got to break Scripture down when I would rather say, so often if you just read it for what it is, you're going to get what, what's in front of you. And th th that's what I want to do today. I want to, 
I want to break this down a little bit in the sense of like, hey, we're just going to break it apart. All we're going to do is just look at Jesus's words and then talk about what they mean. We're not going to like go super deep in this, in this sense because, because Jesus is abundantly clear. So what, what are the three signs of a shallow faith? Well, the first one Jesus says is faith that is easily taken away by doubt and the lies of the enemy. Satan is the king of what? Lies. When God calls us to something bold, we're quickly turned away from it. That's what these people look like. This is what we call apathy in the church. Everybody say apathy. apathy. Or what scripture calls being lukewarm. In the book of Revelation, God is talking to the church in Laodicea, and he says, you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm, therefore I spit you out of my mouth. In other words, in other words, God's saying, hey, I'd rather you not believe at all than have a shallow faith. I, I love coffee, okay? And whenever I think about that passage in Revelation, I think of coffee. Because I love me some iced coffee, okay? And, and if my coffee's hot, it better be hot. I'm talking burn your tongue hot. That's why I love aromas, because I, I could sue them if I, if I was really mean. No, I'm just kidding. But it's hot coffee, right? And then I think, and then I think about drinking like lukewarm coffee, I just think about it, and I, my, I, my mouth just goes, ugh, right? That's what God says about shallow faith. That's how he feels about that. It makes him go, ugh, right? Next time you read that passage, that's what you're going to think is Rob going, ugh, right? You might, as, you might as well not have a faith at all, Jesus says. I, I, I don't need lukewarm. Someone shared their faith with you. Someone talked about Jesus with you. Someone attempted to share the gospel with you, but, but not, not much was getting in there or in here. What do we say as parents? Oh, it just went in one ear and out the other, right? Quite frankly, it may not have taken root at all, let alone in shallow ground. They're, these are people that acknowledge God and say they believe in him, but show zero evidence of it in how they live their lives. I would go so far to say that these people are actually agnostics. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. I'm just not really sure who he is. Not, not, not because people haven't been offered the gospel or, or had it taught to them, or, but because they haven't seen much of a need to really be passionate about Jesus. This is the shallowest of faith. The seed doesn't even get in the soil, right? Because it's, it's on the path. These are the people that claim to be good people and, and, and think they're all right because of their good deeds, but, but not because of a real relationship with Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you think you're a good person apart from Jesus, then what you're saying is Jesus died for no reason. I remember the day I realized I had shallow faith. You see, I, I know this guy really well because I was this guy. I was in high school, and um, at this point, I, I really didn't have much of a faith. Um, but at one, at one point, I'm sitting in the student center with my friend named Chris, who was a, a, a self-proclaimed atheist, okay? And uh, him and I were sitting there talking, and we're debating God and the concept of creation and theology and all these different things. And, uh, and I say debating lightly because I really didn't know probably not much of what I was talking about. But we're sitting there talking about faith and the concept of it and um, what it means to even have God as a creator um, in the universe. And, and at one point, one point, I remember a girl walking up to me. And she, she kind of started listening, up, listening in on our conversation. And then uh, she kind of, kind of gave me a sideways glance. And she goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you're a Christian? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I am. And she's like, oh, I guess I, guess I didn't see it in how you were living your life. You want to talk about a gut check. <laughs> I, I, was, I was shallow soil. I, 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 would, I would say I probably wasn't even soil at all. I was the path. Nothing had, had really taken root, and, and, and I, wasn't, I definitely wasn't bearing fruit. I, I, I can tell you that. Deep faith, church, hear me. Deep faith isn't just surface level. 
that goes beyond. Which is hard to do when your heart is more like the path than rich soil. So, shallow, shallow faith is easily taken away by doubt and the lies of the enemy. Okay? Secondly, shallow faith is easily overcome by persecution and the troubles of this world. Shallow faith is easily overcome by persecution and the troubles of this world. Abraham Lincoln once famously said, if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Well, I would say this. I would say, if you want to test a man's faith, take away his power and see what happens to him. Take away his power. To to where does he turn? To whom does he lean on? How, How does he cope? I say this to tell you that real faith is not shown when things are going well. Let me say that again. Real faith, church, is not shown when things are going well. Real faith is shown when things don't go your way, when when it's no longer the popular thing to believe in, when it's no longer the easy route to take. What, What about when God doesn't give you the answer that you want? When you pray a prayer and he answers your prayer in a different way than you wanted him to. I love love it when people tell me, well, God just didn't answer my prayer. Well, maybe he is sometimes. Maybe his answer is no. As humbling as that may be. What happens when God doesn't give you the answer you want to your prayers? I remember when I used to work at a gas station in high school, we had this guy that was our Pepsi guy. Um, I, I can't think of his name. It's so long ago. Um, I'm 34. Bear with me. Uh, <laughs> but I was like 16 years old. I'm working in the gas station. And uh, I don't remember who the, what the guy's name was, but I remember the conversation I had with him. He was our Pepsi guy. Um, and uh, we were sitting there just talking about faith because I just became really good friends with him. And at that point, I was just on fire for Jesus and telling everybody about what God was doing in my life and um, kind of asked him about his story and what his faith was like and just being really bold in conversation with him. And um, he said, you know, Rob, um, I, I, I really believe that whole God thing until um, I started praying that God would save my marriage, and he didn't, and so after that, I was out. That was his answer to me. Now, as a young 16, 17-year-old kid, I didn't have a clue how to respond to something like that. And, and, and today, I, I, I could get into a hundred reasons as to why God didn't save his marriage. Right? I could give you a hundred reasons like, like maybe, maybe God wanted to work on you in order to save your marriage and you weren't paying attention. Like so often when God, when we ask God for something, right, he just wants you to take a step of, a step of faith in return, amen? So, so a great example, I was just preaching about this last week down in Tiffin uh, at a church plant down there. When we ask for patience, God doesn't always give us patience, does he? What's he do? He gives us opportunities to be patient. God, save my marriage. Hey, why don't you start loving your wife first? God, do this in me. Well, I need, we gotta, we gotta come both ways, brother. Right? You gotta take a step and I'll take a step. I, I, I could get into that even more, but I'm, we're gonna leave it. Let, let, but let's just talk about the lack of depth in the fact that he didn't get what he wanted. Come on, you know, you know the most inspiring faith-filled people are those that hold fast to God despite tragedy or trauma. I've got a friend right now, I've got a friend right now that's been, uh, her life has just been absolute H-E double hockey sticks the last couple years. A faithful, faithful, loving follower of Jesus, okay? Doing every, like, there's, there are a few people on this planet that I think is a closer follower of Jesus than this individual in my life, Okay? And her life has just been really tough lately in the last two years. And you know what's most inspiring about her? Her and I will be talking on the phone about a situation that she's got going on in her family. Her her and I will be talking about a tragedy that happened in her life a couple years ago. Her and I will be just talking about how difficult it is and, and how hard it is. And yet, and yet, and yet, every conversation she ends with, well, you know what? It's hard, but God's still good. Man, it, it's so difficult, but, but I know my God's still good. Can I, can I tell you that's like the most inspiring thing I could hear from an experience like that? Real faith isn't shown when things are 
are going well. The most inspiring faithful people are the people that hold fast to God despite the answer no when they pray or, or, or those that hold fast to God despite their most difficult times in life. In life. Let, let, let's, let's go back to our statement that I just said from Abraham Lincoln. And we're going we're gonna to rework it. I've heard someone else say these words before. If you want to test a man's character, see how he acts when he doesn't get what he wants. Right? I've heard people say that. Well, I, once again, I would take that a step further and I would say this. I said, if you want to see it, test a man's faith, see how he acts when God tells him no. What did Tim say last week? Faith enables me to trust even when things don't seem to work out. And Jesus, Jesus said shallow faith, the, the rocky soil kind of stuff, and it, it quickly falls away when troubles and persecution come. All right, one more. Ready? Shallow faith is easily taken away by doubt and the lies of the enemy. It's easily overcome by persecution and the troubles of this world. And finally, go, there we go. Shallow faith is easily distracted by temporal things. Maybe the word temporary is better for you. And as we look at this one, I just want to read the passage, okay? Because Jesus gets really specific here, okay? He gets really specific here, and, and, and I don't want you to feel like I'm attacking you, okay? <laughs> like, like this is... This is the Holy Spirit kind of stuff, okay? We're just going to read directly from the Word, okay? So let's just read that passage right there in verses 18 and 19 again. So still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the Word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke out the Word, making it what? Read that, say that together. Unfruitful. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and it is deceitful. And the desires for other things. The, the worries of, of this life. What, when we allow a spirit of anxiety to hold us captive, rather than take every thought captive like Scripture calls us to, when we refuse to trust God in the darkest moments and the most difficult times. The worries of life. When we let what others think of us rule over what God created in us and sees in us. I feel like I need to say that one again. When we let other, what others think of us rule over what God created in us and sees in us. When incessant busyness rules over God's call to Sabbath and worship and rest. I got a couple of friends that attend the bridge on Sunday mornings. They're actually from South Africa. Their names are Chris and John. And right now they're working out at Valero. And Valero, I don't know if you know, it's ag season, right? Like, like it's harvest season. Valero's starting to get crazy. And yet, those guys have as much as they're begging them to work. They say, no, 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 no. We need to make the, the right priorities the right priorities. And they're refusing to work on Sundays because not only do they need rest, but they need to worship. Listen, God, God rested on the seventh day. You realize that, right? If God rested, don't you think you need to too? My life is so crazy right now with flag football and church and worship team and all the things that I'm involved in. But can I tell you, can I tell you, Fridays are my Sabbath. They're my priority. I stop and I rest. I take that day off. I don't care how much work I have left on Thursday night. It'll, I'm always going to have more work. I need to stop. I need to rest. I need to contemplate. And I need to delight in the Lord. That's what Sabbath is. When you stop, you rest, you delight, and you contemplate. The deceitfulness of wealth. When our desires for money and stuff and vacations and financial security, quote unquote, overrule the command to give and live generously from everything that God has so generously given us. 
Taylor said this during first service. He said, giving is a continuation of worship. We're not stopping here, right? What are you doing to live and give generously to others and to your church and to the God that so generously gives to you? He didn't give you all that you have just so you could keep it for yourself, amen? He blesses us that we might bless others. He blesses us that we might give to the church and be generous towards the church because the church is the hope of the world and the light of the world. And it's our job as the church to be the church and be the light of the world. And when we acknowledge, when we acknowledge God with our tithes and our offerings and our giving, we acknowledge that everything that we have comes from him. And we, not only that, we, we, we show that we trust that he will take care of whatever we lost when we gave it back to him. Giving is an important thing that God's called us to. Jesus said these things. He said, you can worship God or you can worship money. You don't, it, there's two options. There's no other option. So let me ask you, especially if you're, you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, how's your giving lately? How are you doing with being generous towards your church and towards your family and towards God and what he's given you? Because the deceitfulness the deceitfulness of wealth will keep you in the shallows. It will. The desires for other things. That one, that one could mean a plethora of things, right? The desires for other things. It could be anything that overcasts God, right? When I'd rather... Um, Stay in bed than be part of the Sunday morning gathering. When, I, when, when life group is the first thing to come off the calendar and the most common thing to come off the calendar. When, it, when, when I'd rather have another drink, even though I know it's not a, probably not a good idea, but gosh darn it, I've had a long week and I deserve it. When sports and work and hobbies take priority over everything else, God and the church being the chief of which end up paying the biggest price. Come, come on, church. Nobody... Nobody wants anyone to characterize them as shallow. Amen? Like, none of us are like, hey, man, I want my gravestone to say shallowest of faith. Like, that's me. Oh, man, give it to me. Right? We don't want our friends to characterize us as that. And yet, and yet, and yet, too many of us identify with the shallow seeds in this passage. And what's scary is, not only would our friends characterize us as shallow, God would. And I don't know about you, but that's terrifying to me. How deep, how deep, how deep is your faith? No one here wants to be described as shallow. And, and not only that, but we also see here that shallow faith, shallow faith produces nothing eternal for us. And if I can be blunt with you for a moment, shallow faith produces nothing for us in this life either. Eternal or not, shallow faith gets you Nowhere. Everybody say nowhere. nowhere. Let me be bold for a minute. Because I think this is what, what Jesus would, would, would even say if we go back to our lukewarm passage in the book of Revelation. If you're going to have a shallow faith that doesn't say, I'm willing to jump in with both feet, you might as well not have a faith at all. Because it's not going to take you anywhere. And it's not going to do anything for you. Sometimes we have people that come to the bridge and they're like, well, I just didn't get it. It's because the word, you didn't let the word take root in you. I love you, but like, we're doing everything we can. Like, we're not perfect, let me be honest with you, but we're, not doing, we're doing everything we can to help you root the word of God in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, and, and, and to worship him with all your strength. So the question is, what are you doing to allow it to take root in you? And, and, and I get it. For some of you, that, I realize that's not an easy statement to hear because you're here and you're just now starting to explore this whole Jesus thing and you're kind of dipping your toe in the water, but, but can I tell you something? I've never met a single person that decided to follow Jesus, jumped in with both feet and regretted it. Never have I ever met somebody that way that says, no, I want a real, genuine, authentic faith in Jesus Christ. I've never met a single soul that's regretted that. And some of you guys are trying to dip your toe in the water, and I'm telling you, jump in. Stop cutting out the parts of the Bible and the parts of Rob's sermons and the parts of Eric's messages and the parts of CR, Celebrate Recovery, that you don't like. <clears throat> Go deeper. Surrender that thing over to God that you've been holding on to. Because I think if you and I are both honest with yourself, 
The way you've been going hasn't changed much and really hasn't done much for you. All right. Now, this is what I don't want. As we look at that list there, okay, I I don't want us to look at that message and go, wow, I must just have such a shallow faith and feel super discouraged and insecure and upset. That's not my goal this morning, okay? So, So if you're like, wow, Rob, you're being a huge Debbie Downer right now, please just hold on, okay? Hold on with me, okay? Because this is kind of like um, this is kind of like kids' sports, okay? And I'm going to tell you that in a minute, okay? But what you need to understand is this, okay? Jesus said, "Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains." Okay, everybody say mustard seed. You know how big a mustard seed is? Okay, a few of us, right? Really tiny, right? If, if you don't know what a, how big a mustard seed is, how many of you have seen a poppy seed, right? Like my wife makes these ham and cheese sliders that I think are uh, ordained from the Spirit of God, okay? And they've got poppy seeds on them. They're little, little, little tiny seeds, okay? That's how big a mustard seed is, all right? And Jesus says a faith like that can move mountains. So let me encourage you with that, okay? But then, but then, let me, let me encourage you to be like a kid that just got put on the bench, okay? Because what happens in kids' sports all the time, right? All the time, kids get put on the bench, right? And then they get all upset, like, this is stupid, like, why am I on the bench? I want to play basketball. You know, like, why, why has coach got to put me on the bench? Or worse yet, their parents get upset, and they go over top of their kid, and they yell at the coach because they're not playing their kid, right? Here's, what's the proper response when coach benches you? Man, I got some work to do. Man, I, I better, if I want to get back in the game, I, I better start practicing. I better start working at this thing. I better start doing everything I can to improve my craft so that coach can put me back and so I can start again, right? And, and this, is, this, is, this is what I f- think God is asking for from you. He's not asking for you. If, if you're feeling convicted this morning, he's not trying to condemn you or give you a spirit of condemnation. He's just saying, hey, listen, listen, we got some work to do, amen? And, and I want to be careful here because I f- get that faith isn't just something that we control ourselves. I do believe that it's something that comes from God, but then I also believe it's something we can work out. So, so how can we work at our faith? How can we develop and grow our faith? Well, number one, we can pray for it. And some of you guys might think this is too simple, but, but can I tell you how many times the apostles literally, literally looked Jesus right in the face and said, hey, increase our faith, Lord. Like, God, just give it to us. I, I do devotions every day, right? And, and, and when I do that, I do something called soap journaling, okay? And where I break down the passage and I, I look at it. And at the end of that soap... It's S-O-P, uh, S-O-A-P, uh, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. Can I tell you how many prayers I've asked God for more faith? How many times I write down, God, give me more faith. God, give me more courage. God, show me, show me your face in this area. God, God, help me to understand. God, give me more clarity. Pray for it. That's how you can develop it. Just start with prayer. God, I want more faith. I want to go deeper. Number two, study it. How can you have faith if you don't know what it is, Right? How can you have faith if you don't know what it is? The book of Romans says this. It says, so faith comes from what? Hearing. In other words, I'm doing everything I can to hear and listen to and read and know the word of God. Sunday mornings matter. Hearing the word preached and taught to you on a regular basis matters. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Okay, so we need to study it. We need to get in our word more often. If you want resources on how to do that, please, please, I'm begging you, come find me or somebody with a lanyard after service. They'll show you our our, our discipleship method and how we can help you read your Bible. We have resources we can give you. You gotta study it. Number three, you've gotta obey it. Sometimes growing our faith starts with obedience. And, And let me say this again. Stop cutting out the parts you don't like. Obey all of it. Every word. I'm telling you, it will produce fruit, and I'm not speaking of this as the cliche pastor. I'm speaking of this as someone who's seen it proven in his life. Obey it. Sometimes growing our faith is just, you know what, I'm just going to be obedient to God here. I remember that story about Phil Robertson. He was fishing on the river. And he had all these catfish lines, okay? And these kids kept coming and stealing his fish. And they kept, com- kept coming and stealing his fish and stealing his fish. And fi- I mean, this is like just as he's starting to get into his faith with Jesus, right? And one day he catches them stealing his fish from their line, from his line, right? 
and he pulls his boat up to theirs. He goes, hey, boys, how's it going? Right? And of course, they're like nervous as all get out as he holsters the shotgun. Right? Okay? And, um, and so they start getting afraid, and they start getting worried. And, and he remembers the passage where Jesus says, if, if your brother strikes you, offer him the other cheek. So you know what Phil Robertson did? He emptied every one of his lines into those, those boys' boats. Every single one of their lines. He was just obedient to what God, what he knew the word said. And he gave them all the fish he could possibly give them. And you know what happened? Those boys never stole from his lines again. Sometimes increasing our faith. What, how, what do you think that did to Phil's faith? Oh man, that grew it, right? Obey it. Just, just to step into it. God, I'm, I'm going to obey you even though I don't see the fruit from it right away. Lastly, Okay, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. And Bruce, you can start playing right away, big dog. Um, exercise it. Exercise it. Okay? This is kind of a lot like obe obeying it, but this is more where it's like, hey, faith's like a muscle. Okay? And, and it gets stronger the more you use it. In other words, when you get in those situations where it's hard to lean on God... You're going to exercise that muscle and you're going to lean on God anyway. Amen? In other words, I'm going to choose to believe that God is with me when it's so hard to see. I'm just going to hold on and I'm going to believe on faith that this is going to come through for me. I'm going to exercise that muscle. I love what, what, what um, uh, Dave and Ashley Willis, they were talking about marriage. And they, talk, they said, laziness leads... Uh, to weak muscles and unhealthy bodies. Likewise, don't expect a strong marriage if you're not willing to put in the work. I loved it. I thought that was a great quote, right? But I, well, again, let me rework a quote. Laziness leads to weak muscles, right? And unhealthy bodies. Likewise, don't expect to have a strong faith. Don't expect to have a strong faith if you're not willing to put in the work. Church, I... I I'm so sick of shallow Christians. I'm just going to be blunt. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of people misrepresenting Jesus. I, I, I'm tired of people coming in on Sunday mornings with plastic faces. I'm tired of, uh, uh, of putting on a plastic face myself because I, I, there, there are some Sundays where I'm just, I'm exhausted. I want to be a real church, don't you? I want people to walk in here and go, man... Those people at the bridge, let me tell you, there's something different about them. They're not coming in acting like they got it all together. They're coming in with all their hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and they're just letting it hang out, and they're saying, Gee, they're surrendering over to Jesus. And they've got a peace. They've got a peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't matter what troubles or persecution come that, that church's way, man. They just keep rolling. They just keep rolling. They keep loving. They keep serving. They keep giving. Church, none of us. None of us want to be described as shallow. So let's stop being shallow. Kind of reminds me of what my dad said when I was a kid all the time. I'd always do something or I'd get bad grades or do something like that. And he'd go, well, Rob, who, who controls you? I do. So let's, let's do this. Let's look at these four things and go, okay, God, what do you, what do you want to do in me? Just pick one. I, I do this every week, right? If I give you a list, I just want you to pick one. Where, where do you need to spend more time asking for God to give you more faith? Maybe for you, it's that you need to have more depth of knowledge of who, who King Jesus is. Maybe there's that one thing, that one thing that you have yet to surrender over to Jesus and be obedient to. You've been holding it back. You're like, God, I'll take all this, but I'm not giving you that, right? Right? God, you can have all this, but oh, that one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold, whether it's money or, or, or sex or, 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 or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's just a, a, something that you've been meaning to surrender. Maybe it's a bitterness. Maybe it's an unforgiveness that you've been harboring and holding on to. What is it that you just need to be obedient to and surrender over to Jesus? That you might begin exercising the muscle of faith. I, I, I believe I believe that if we were willing to work at it, God's going to take us deeper. Don't you, church? Life is not found in the shallows. 
It's found in the depths. God, we recognize that this morning. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, whose love that we're about to sing about is so much deeper than any ocean we could ever imagine, Lord, that expands the, the length of the universe that's as far as the east is from the west. God, maybe that be our motivation to go deeper in our faith, your son, Jesus' love that saved us from Satan's sin and death. God, may we proclaim that from the rooftops. May we do everything we can to help others know about the peace that we have that transcends all understanding. May our, 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 our faith produce fruit, Lord. May our, our church, excuse me, may our church produce fruit like it never has before. May we produce a crop 30, 60, 100 times what was sown, Lord. Sometimes, Lord, your church doesn't grow because we're not sowing enough. May we sow as a church and do the work necessary to see your kingdom expand and your glory resound. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for the word that you brought to us today. And we look forward to how we're gonna put it into action this week in the name of your son, Jesus. And all God's people said,